Sure. So, yeah, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Brandon Minnick, and in this session, we'll be talking about choosing the best mobile app framework. Now, full disclosure, yes, I do work at Microsoft, and uh, yes, we do have a, a tool called Xamarin, and yes, I also used to work at Xamarin. I'm a, I am a mobile app developer myself. I've been making iOS and Android apps for years now. But today's talk will not be biased, I promise. This is uh, any, uh, more of an overview about all the different mobile frameworks that are available to us um, as developers. So uh, let's see, quick show of hands. How many folks in here are making mobile apps today? OK, so we have a couple folks. And let's see, who wants to make a mobile app in the future? All right, so you're in the right place. So the inspiration for this talk was there are so many options today when creating mobile applications that when your, when your boss comes to you and says, well, we've, you know, we have a website, but now we want to make our first mobile app. And he says, you have two weeks to figure it out. And so what do you do? Well, you start frantically Googling things online, trying to figure out um, what are the pros and cons of each, of each framework. Well, it's, it's daunting. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of options available. And along with that, there's also just a lot of information. And what I've found over the years is not necessarily that anybody is trying to mislead you, everybody is, uh, but everybody's always looking to promote their product, right? So you might, you might read a blog post that was published by a consulting company that says, this framework's the best. But then it turns out that consulting company specializes in that framework. So of course they want you to use that so you can pay them money and uh, they'll help you make your app. Or maybe uh, one company chooses to highlight all the amazing things that their framework can do and conveniently forget to mention some of the downsides. So uh, what we're going to discuss today is what are the pros and cons to all of this? And there's a lot of things to think about. This isn't just uh, what's, what's our favorite language, and we're going to choose that. Uh, there's all these considerations that we have to take into account. Uh, things like time to market. Maybe we only have a couple months to get this mobile app published and in the app stores. Well, do we have enough time to use the first party native solutions where that would require us to make the same app twice in two different code bases? Do we have enough time to hire developers to ramp up and deliver? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that means it's a good choice to go with a cross-platform solution. App performance. This one, honestly, really isn't too much of a concern nowadays. Uh, just about every framework we're going to cover today, this is no longer a concern. Uh, all the frameworks are pretty mature. They've been around for years, if not over a decade now. And for probably 95% of apps, performance will not be a concern on any of these platforms. But as we go over them, I'll make sure to address uh, the specific concerns for each framework. Feature availability. Now, this is a big one. Um, what are you doing with your app? Because our, our mobile devices, they come with just a suite of features, things like push notifications, Bluetooth, geolocation, um, storage, all these things that Maybe your app needs, but maybe it doesn't. So maybe you're making a augmented reality app, something that needs to use the camera, it needs to take advantage of all the, um, all the machine learning and built into the processors, something like iOS offers this API or SDK called ARKit, Google has AR Core, and you really need that performance. Well, is that available to you? There's also just third-party risks. Um, I think we all know that Apple and Google, they make uh, iOS and Android. And along with those, they also create their own development tools. And they are the first party frameworks. And every other framework we talk about today will be a third party framework. And when choosing a third party framework, you take that risk that maybe the company doesn't support it anymore. You know, what if we made our app using React Native and Facebook tomorrow decides to stop supporting it? That's a risk. It's unlikely. Uh, React Native is very popular, very powerful, but maybe they make that business decision. Now, 
The good news is React Native is open source, so open source never technically dies. The community can continue, uh, continue it on, but that is always one of the risks that we take when we use a third-party platform. Hiring, this is probably the hardest challenge, and it's also usually the most overlooked. You know, we might find that perfect framework. This one suits all of our needs. It's so good, but do we have any developers in our area that know how to code in Swift? Do we have any developers here that can do .NET if we choose Xamarin? Will we be able to build our team? If you ever had to hire a team, you know it's very hard. And so one of the considerations to look at is when we choose this framework, will we be able to hire the folks to support it? Or maybe are we comfortable with employing a remote team? And of course, there's development costs. You have to pay developers money, and that money all goes in, that money and that time goes into developing the app. And then there's also maintenance costs. And maintenance costs usually are way bigger than anything in development because, well, maintenance is adding new features. Maintenance is fixing bugs. And depending on which framework you choose, you might have more work ahead of you for uh, maintenance than you might expect. So as we're going today, you'll notice two links at the bottom of these slides. Uh, on the left, this is my Twitter handle. This is the best way to get in contact with me. So if you have any questions, you want to follow up, feel free to shoot me a message. My direct messages are always open. I'm always happy to chat about mobile. And on the right, this is a website that I put together just for us today. This contains everything from today's session, from the slides to a recording that I've made. And it also includes a lot of helpful links. So if you have any friends or coworkers that wanted to attend but couldn't make it, you can just share this link with them. They can watch the video, and they can dive deeper into all of those links to learn more about it. But jumping into it, we're going to start with what we call the first-party native apps. Uh, to no surprise, these are the ones made by Apple and Google. So if you are making an iOS app for uh, if you're making an iOS app, you'll be using Apple's development tool Xcode, and Google provides their own called Android Studio. And what we'll do is we'll talk about these, this list here in the top right. And so, yes, these are owned and created by Apple and Google. And so you don't really have that first or that third party risk. I mean, as long as Apple creates iOS, and as long as Google creates Android, they're going to continue creating their development tools. The UI and the UX, totally native. Um, we're going to be using this word native a lot today. Native refers to the fact that you'll be using the APIs supplied by iOS and Android. So when Apple and Google make their development platforms, they provide all the suite of APIs you need, anything for building your UIs, like APIs for buttons and labels, to running code for like APIs to make uh, calls to remote, uh, remote APIs, APIs for using things like Bluetooth. So anytime we see the word native, that means it is using the native APIs. And of course, we're in their tools, and we're using their native APIs. So no surprises there. The development speed is going to be a little slower. Now, when I say slow, this is in comparison to all of the other frameworks we're going to be talking about today. Everything today is, is definitely relative. You, know, you can still have very fast development speeds. But in general, it's slower because we are creating the same app twice. We are creating our iOS app in Xcode using either Swift or, Swift or Objective-C. And we're creating that same app again for Android in Android Studio using either Java or Kotlin. And so even though the app looks the same, even though it has the same functionality, we can't share that code between our two apps. So what does that mean? Well, we'll probably have to hire two development teams, or, or we have the one team make the first app, then the second app. So our development speed, comparatively to the other frameworks, is going to be a little slower. Maintenance costs, likewise, will also be a little bit higher. Um, and for exactly the same reason, we have to maintain two code bases. So we have our Swift code, we have our Java code. They're going to have different architectures. They're going to have different bugs. When we want to add in that new feature, we have to add it in twice. So compared to any of the cross-platform frameworks, our maintenance costs will be a little higher. Now our performance, very high. 
you don't get any faster than using the native tools. Uh, the cross-platform frameworks all will come with a little bit of overhead, uh, although that being said, the, the cross-platform native ones we'll talk about, that overhead's pretty much negligible nowadays, but it still doesn't get any faster than, um, or your app performance doesn't get any faster than the native tool. So if you have something that really needs that high performance, that maybe it's a game, maybe it's gonna be doing real-time um, video analysis or machine learning, then maybe we wanna take advantage of these first-party tools. The programming language, like we mentioned, for iOS, it's either Swift or Objective-C. I think more and more folks are choosing Swift nowadays. And on Android, you can either use Java or Kotlin. And of course, the maturity, they're very mature. Um, these tools have been around ever since iOS and Android have been around. Of course, they're feature complete, meaning you have access to all of the native APIs. So if you want to do AR stuff, if you want to do Bluetooth, if you don't want to do geolocation, push notifications, you have every feature possible available to you. And then when it comes to open source, we have a, we have a no and a yes. iOS is not open source, but Android is. And actually, that's how Android started. It was a more of a community project that Google will say they adopted, and now they lead the charge on it. OK, so getting into what are the other options? Well, nowadays, there are progressive web apps. Uh, who here is familiar with uh, progressive web apps or PWAs? OK, a couple folks, nice. So if you haven't heard of progressive web apps, they are slightly different from your no normal web app in the fact that a normal web app, when it makes a request to the server, the server generates all the code sends it back down to your browser, and the browser essentially just displays what the server renders. With a PWA, or a progressive web app, when the browser makes that request, all that information is downloaded to that user's device, and then the browser is what handles all of that, uh, all of that rendering. And so what we get with PWAs, we can bring that to mobile, and we can actually have essentially a website run as if it were a native app on a mobile device. So for the framework owners here, there are a bunch. I've listed some of the popular ones here, anything from Microsoft's Blazor to Native Script, React, Ionic. Uh, you, can, you can choose any of these to make your PWA. And now for the UI UX, the user interface, the user experience, this is where things get a little different because we are now creating a bespoke UI. We are now writing the UI ourselves. We're using whatever tool we chose. So if we're using Blazor, that would be using .NET. If we were using uh, React, it'd be in JavaScript. And we have to draw everything on the screen. So if we want to put a button on the screen, we can't just leverage iOS's API for UI button. Um, we have to paint that on the screen ourselves. If we want to do navigation, well, we have to create that navigation stack ourselves. If we want to show animations, we have to do that ourselves. Whereas with the native frameworks, a lot of that you just get for free. Like for uh, iOS, you can essentially say like animate and you can tell it to rotate. Here, we're writing that code ourselves. So maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, but it is totally a bespoke UI because it's essentially just our website running on a mobile device. But the good news is your development speed is going to be a lot faster. So with the first party native tools, we were creating that same app twice. With PWAs, we create the app once and it just runs on both platforms. So we're able to get to market a little bit faster than we would if we were using the first party tools. Maintenance cost is, is definitely lower than using the first party tools, but I left it here at medium because of that bespoke UI. Now, what happens when iOS and Android change their UI paradigms, which they love to do? They just did it with dark mode. And as a, as a mobile developer, I then had to go and implement dark mode for my apps. But since I use something like Xamarin that allows me to access the native APIs, I got a lot of that for free. Apple and Google, they have APIs to help us out with that as developers. But since we're not using those APIs for our PWA, well, we have to implement that all ourselves. So we would have to essentially have a whole second UI rewrite to implement dark mode. Or if you remember in iOS 7, 
when IMS moved from the skeuomorphic design where everything was very realistic to that flat UI, well, that means we have to, again, redo the app all of ourselves, whereas if we were just using the native APIs, we would have gotten that, or a lot of that, for free. So while maintenance costs will be lower because we only have one app, so we can fix a bug once, we can implement a new feature once, and it'll run on both iOS and Android, the maintenance costs will be a little higher when those operating system level UI changes do happen. So I mentioned performance at the top, and I said it's not really an issue. And honestly, it's still not really an issue. But compared to the other frameworks we're looking at today, we give performance a medium on PWAs. And honestly, probably still for 95% of the apps, they're going to run totally fine. Not going to be an issue. Um, for example, on PWAs, a button click takes about 100 milliseconds to respond. So when the user taps a button on your app, your code will fire in about 100 milliseconds. The user cannot detect that. You know, our, the way our brains work, we can only detect things so quickly, and it is still imperceivable to the user. But compared to the native frameworks, that, uh, like the first party native and the third party frameworks we'll be talking about, their reaction time is about 10 milliseconds. So in comparison, yeah, 100 is a lot higher than 10. It's 10 times bigger, but it's still imperceptible to the user. So for most apps, it's going to be totally fine, totally unnoticeable. But I don't know, maybe you're making a game where uh, you have to tell the player to jump at certain times, and you have to really make sure that it's very responsive. Well, maybe PWAs aren't the right way to go. Uh, the programming language, there's multiple. Like we mentioned earlier, there's .NET, there's JavaScript, there's a bunch of different options. And the maturity level, I put it as adolescent. This is still a pretty new technology, but it's not brand new. Uh, PWAs have been around for a couple years, but they're still not as mature in comparison to the other frameworks. Although I would say by now, we've pretty much ironed out all the kinks with the tooling and the specs for PWAs. Now, feature access is what might get you. So, Here's a, here's a, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just a couple examples of what you can and cannot do with PWAs. Now, the reason we're limited is the spec for progressive web apps was written for browsers running on a desktop. So if you think about what features do I have available to me in a browser on a desktop, those are pretty much the features that you'll have access to on mobile. So things like geolocation. If I'm, on, if I'm on my Mac and I navigate to Google Maps and I say, give me directions, it'll say, do you mind if I use your location? I say, yeah, go ahead. And so geolocation is one of the features that we get for browsers and a desktop. And so now it's one of the features we can take advantage of for our PWA on our mobile apps. Uh, same with things like the camera. I've used my camera in my browser to chat and you know, Skype and Google Hangouts. And again, you get that camera in mobile for PWAs as well. But once you get into things that are very mobile specific, like vibration, you know, apps all the time will make your phone buzz if you do something, well, right or wrong, depending on the application. But laptops don't really vibrate. So that's not part of the spec for PWAs. Um, augmented reality, you know, iOS and Android have these very highly tuned, high performance SDKs that will take advantage of your camera and uh, draw things on the world around you. And you get all that essentially for free. You can just tell it where to put the image and it actually makes it pretty easy to use it or use augmented reality. That's just not a thing for desktop browsers, or at least not yet. So these features might be a deal breaker for you for your mobile app. If, if you need something specific, then maybe PWAs aren't the right way to go. And then as for open source, it depends. So I recommend as you're exploring the different frameworks to look up whether or not one's open source and if that is a deal breaker for you or not. Now, all that being said, PWAs have a killer feature, something that me as an iOS and Android developer, I am so jealous of. And that is that PWAs can be installed on any device without needing to go through the App Store. So why am I jealous of this? Well, when I submit my app to the iOS App Store, I can't just put it on the store for you to download. I have to literally submit it to Apple and say, 
can you please review this? And then Apple combs through it, and, and you know, it's kind of a good thing, because Apple will do a security check, make sure there's no security vulnerabilities, but they also have a bunch of guidelines, and if you don't follow a guideline, then they are, you know, judge and jury, they can say, nope, sorry, can't have that in the App Store. I've never, well, I take that back. I've, I've had a couple submissions get rejected. Um, if you're ever using beta versions, like if uh, before iOS 13 was pushed out, I was trying to add in dark mode functionality, but I was using the beta version of Xcode, and Apple doesn't like you using beta bits to pu publish your production apps, so yeah, they kick mine back. But they have carte blanche. They can, they can approve or reject anything they want. And along with that, the review time takes a couple days. So when I'm ready to publish my code, you don't get it right away. You get it a couple days later after Apple's finished reviewing it and then published it to the store. Now, as, an, as a mobile app developer, um, what also kills me is people don't update their apps. I've, I still have users that are a version of my app that I published two years ago. I, I wish everybody had automatic updates turned on by default. You know, I put a lot of work into my apps, and I want to give you the latest features and the bug fixes, but some people just don't do it. And so what does that mean for me as a developer? Well, that means, well, now I, every change I make to my back end, if I want to add a row or a column to a table, or maybe I do a database migration, or maybe I update my API, how will that impact that mobile app that I wrote two years ago? And then eventually, you'll get to a point where you have to make a business decision, where you need to implement a breaking change, and it will affect people. Now, so you look at how many people are still using that, well, maybe it's only two people. And you're like, ah, OK, like, sorry, guys, but we got to do it. So it, it makes it really difficult, because your users are never going to be on the latest, greatest version of the app, whereas with a PWA, they will be, because as soon as that app launches, it can check back in with the server and download the latest, greatest version. So if you've never done it before, this is how you install a PWA on your device. You just navigate to the website that was built using PWA. There we go. Then you literally just tap on Add to Home Screen, and it downloads the app, puts it on your home screen, and the app runs as its own application. So you'll see when I go to the, the uh, multitask viewer, that is Google Maps. That's not Safari. It's not running in the browser when I launch it. It is running as its own application. And so huge advantage that PWAs have over all of the other uh, native frameworks we're talking about today. And man, am, am I jealous of this, because I, I would love this for my apps. OK, diving back into native apps. These are uh, cross-platform native apps. So again, when we say native, it means that these frameworks use the native APIs. These are the most popular ones. So Xamarin allows you to make iOS and Android apps in C Sharp. That's my favorite, because, well, I was a C Sharp developer, and I wanted to make mobile apps. So it was a very easy choice for me to go to Xamarin. Uh, React Native is the same thing, but for JavaScript developers. So if you're a JavaScript developer, or maybe you're, you have a team full of JavaScript developers that are looking to get into mobile, React Native gives you all the access to the native APIs, compiles down to a native app. Flutter's pretty new. This is actually using Dart, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And I've listed a couple, we'll say, rising stars in the community. There's Uno and Kotlin Native. Uno also lets you make mobile apps using the UWP XAML. And Kotlin allows you to make mobile apps using, well, Kotlin. But for today, let's focus on the top three. So Xamarin, uh, like I mentioned, it's made by Microsoft. You create your apps in Visual Studio. And looking at the UI UX, still totally native. So when you create your app using Xamarin, you're still using all of the iOS and Android APIs, because all Xamarin does is it just wraps every single API on iOS and exposes them to us in C-sharp. And it wraps every single API in Android and exposes those to us in C-sharp. So we're literally using the same APIs. When we click Compile, our app boils down to the native binary. Mobile phones don't know the difference. It is native. Our, de our development speed is going to be a little bit faster, because now we can share code. Now that we are making our iOS app in C-sharp and our Android app in C-sharp, well, 
we can share code between them. And so we don't have to worry about having two teams and two different code bases. We can make that app. We can essentially uh, leverage the same code for both iOS and Android. And because of that, our maintenance cost will be a little bit lower. Performance is high. You know, like I mentioned earlier, you're never going to get the highest performance that you would get using the first party tools. There's always a little bit of overhead. But if you go around for some studies for there's been performance bench benchmarks against all of the cross-platform native frameworks, it's literally negligible. You're not, your users won't know the difference. And we can take advantage of um, all the other benefits for, for using cross-platform. Now, I keep saying C Sharp, but technically, yes, you can make a Xamarin app in F Sharp if you want to try that out, because it just requires .NET, which allows us to leverage both. Maturity, Xamarin's very mature. It's been around for over a decade now. So the tools are all there. The frameworks are all there. All the specs are in place. We don't have to worry about uh, jumping on any latest, greatest technology. Like I mentioned, it is native. We have this all the access to all the same native APIs, so we get every feature we want. If you wanted to do that um, AR app, you can do that, because you have access to every single API. And as long as you have Visual Studio and you install the updates, you'll get all the latest, greatest API updates as Apple and Google release them as well. And it's open source. And I appreciate this, because anytime I hit a snag in my app, I'll always jump into the source code and be like, well, uh, you know, how is how's this Xamarin thing working? And it's like, oh, OK, it was expecting me to do this, but I gave it that. So always super helpful for debugging and developing. React Native. So React Native is, is created, owned, and maintained by Facebook. And you can use a bunch of different IDEs, like WebStorm or Visual Studio Code or Atom to create your apps. And it's UI UX. Again, it's still native. You're still using the native APIs. Uh, similar to Xamarin, it, your development speed is going to be faster because you're writing that app once in JavaScript. And you can leverage that same code for both iOS and Android. Same, same. Maintenance cost is going to be a little bit lower because we only have one set of, or we only have one source of code. So if we want to fix that bug, we only have to fix it once. If we want to implement a new feature, we only have to implement it once. Just like Xamarin performance is going to be high, again, never going to be as high as the native tools, but the difference is definitely negligible. The programming language is JavaScript, so if you have a team of JavaScript developers, I think it makes a lot of sense to use React Native. And it's been around for years. It's a very mature framework. Um, you don't have to worry about any uh, growing pains as, as uh, you might with a newer framework. And feature access complete. So you can download the updates that Facebook pushes out. They push them out over NPM. And that's where you'll find all the latest, greatest iOS and Android APIs as they come out. And just like Xamarin, it's also open source. Now, Flutter is brand new. Um, Google just released this. I think they just released version 1 last December, if I remember correctly. So it's been a, it's V1 has been around for about a year. Uh, Flutter itself has been around a little bit longer than that. So you've probably heard about it for a couple years now, but it was always had the preview tag on it. It always was in pre-release, but they finally pushed it. So it is, it is new. It is kind of the latest, greatest. It's something that Google created. So it's their tool to create uh, cross-platform applications. Now, the big difference between Xamarin and React Native versus Flutter is that Flutter's UI is totally bespoke. Uh, the way Flutter UI works, they actually use Skia. Uh, how many folks here are, have heard of Skia? OK, a couple folks. It's essentially, think of it as you have a blank canvas. So like you're an artist, and you can draw anything you want on this canvas. And that is the technology that Google is leveraging to create the UIs in Flutter. So you are actually not using the native iOS and Android APIs to put your or to draw your buttons or to handle your navigation patterns or your animations. Uh, Flutter is totally bespoke. Now, they do a good job of providing uh, providing tools and SDKs for you, so you can kind of plug in. Um, you can plug in what they've drawn to mimic an iOS button, or they've drawn to mimic the the native Android button, but it is still bespoke. So we still have that concern that we talked about with PWAs, where 
what happens when the iOS or when iOS and Android change their UI paradigms? What happens when they, I don't know, what will be next between light mode and dark mode, maybe an in-between mode or high contrast mode? Well, you're going to have to recreate that UI all over again, which is a little bit of a pain. But your development speed, just like the other cross-platform tools, is going to be fast because, again, write the app once, run it on both platforms. But your maintenance cost, I put it, this is medium, just like PWAs. Your maintenance cost is low because you have to only fix that bug once. You have to only implement that new feature once. But when those UI redesigns come out, when in, I don't know, iOS 15, iOS says, nope, we're changing everything from flat to bubbles. Well, you have to recreate your whole UI again because Flutter's using all of uh, this bespoke drawing tool with Skia. Its performance is just as high, and ironically, drawing the UI in Skia turns out to be faster than the native tools. So Google actually gives you a little bit of an edge there, but with any cross-platform tool, there is going to be a little overhead, but again, very negligible in today's apps. The programming language is Dart. This one's a little interesting, because when we talk about hiring and building a team, Dart is brand new. Um, Google created it basically for Flutter, and not a lot of developers are, are using or have used Dart. But that being said, as a C-sharp developer myself, I've taken a look at Dart, and it looks and feels very familiar to C-sharp. So I have a hunch if you were to hire Java or C-sharp developers, they would be able to come up to speed on Dart pretty quickly. Now, like we mentioned, the maturity of Flutter is it's still pretty young. They just promoted it to uh, V1 recently. So they are still, uh, still working out some of the kinks, and they still have some of the growing pains that the other cross-platform tools also had early on. But you do get access to every single API, so any feature you want to implement, Google offers those to us via NPM, and it's also open source. All right, so let's talk about a couple possible scenarios to kind of bring this all together, right? So let's say we are working at a company that wants to make a simple app. Uh, we already have an existing website that was built in AngularJS. So we have an engineering team full of web devs, and our app is pretty simple. It's just going to be kind of entering some text into some forms. And so what would we choose for this one? Well, in this case, making a PWA, specifically with Angular, makes a lot of sense. And honestly, we might, depending on how our website was created, we might be able to leverage a lot of that for our mobile app. But what about this scenario? So now we have a company that wants to make an augmented reality app. So they're going to need those, uh, the AR kit and AR core APIs that iOS and Android offer. But the good news is they have venture capital funding. So they've got millions of dollars in the bank. They don't have to worry about development costs because they can hire the best and the brightest. They can have two development teams. Doesn't matter. That being said, they're also very risk adverse. They don't want to necessarily trust any third party frameworks. You know, they're always worried about what if, uh, what if it stops being supported. So in this case, it makes a lot of sense to use uh, first party native. And then what if you already have an existing website? Maybe you have a team of ASP.NET developers, so you know .NET, you have the .NET expertise, and you're still, but you still want a native app. So if, if we didn't need the native app, then we could have gone the Blazor route and done a PWA. But in this case, Xamarin makes a lot of sense. All right, so all of that being said, what is the best mobile framework? It's the best one for your team. Like I said, I, I love Xamarin. I, I'm a big fan of .NET and C Sharp, and it made it very easy to get into iOS and Android for me as a C Sharp developer. But maybe you're not. And there's so many great tools out there that we can choose from that it doesn't make sense to necessarily pick one or the other because performance is pretty much the same across the board. And if you understand the, the different nuances, like Flutter is going to be redrawing the UI, that's going to be bespoke. A PWA doesn't have access to every feature on mobile, but maybe that doesn't matter for, for our use case. So choose the best one for your team. 
All right, if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure to take out your phone and grab a picture of this link. Like I said, this is where you can find all the slides. This is where you can find a recording that I've made of this video, and also links that you can use to learn more about all these different frameworks. So if you have any uh, friends or colleagues that couldn't make it today, feel free to share this with them and pass it along. Thank you. All right, I think we do have some time for questions. Uh, I see some hands. Do we have a microphone? It's already back there, OK. Thanks. So I just have a quick question. Um, when do you think that uh, Xamarin is going to be available for Visual Studio Code? Because uh, Flutter and other frameworks are already. Thanks. Yeah, no, good question. So when, is, when will Xamarin be available in Visual Studio Code? So uh, yes and no. I mean, technically, you can make Xamarin apps, in, you can write them in Visual Studio Code, but yeah, it's a lot nicer to do it in Visual Studio because we get, we can just click to deploy. That is something we're looking into. So I'm not going to make any promises, but know that it's something that the team's aware of, and if we can make it work, we will make it work. So we'll say stay tuned. And there's also another cool solution. Uh, has anybody in here heard of Comet? All right, a couple folks. Comet um, is a very experimental. It's kind of, if you remember where Blazor was a couple years ago, where it was brand new, hot off the presses in that experimental phase, that's where Comet is today. And what Comet is, ooh, let's ask another question. Who here has heard of Swift UI? OK. So iOS came out with Swift UI, or Apple came out with Swift UI. Uh, basically, it's their simplified version for making apps. They, it's a fluent. Uh, way to make your apps all in code. And that inspired a couple of our engineers to say, like, well, why can't we do that with C Sharp and kind of offer that cross platform experience? So uh, I'll make sure if it's not already on there, I'll add Comet to, that, to the landing page for the website we put together today. But it's really cool. I'd recommend checking it out because it was made for VS Code. So you can do, you can say .NET new Comet, you can do everything that you need to do there in VS Code. And if, you, um, if you're like me, I like to make my UI and code. I like to use C Sharp. Uh, the fluent syntax is just beautiful. It has hot reload and hot refresh and all the buzzwords all baked into it. So it's, it's beautiful. I, I, hope it, I hope to see it takes off. So for today, yeah, check out Comet if that's something that uh, if VS Code is kind of your path forward. And then, yeah, we'll, uh, stay tuned for for any announcements from the team as we are investigating how to bring Xamarin into VS Code. Thank you, good question. What else, yes? Uh, you talked about the killer feature of PVAs, uh, the add to home screen. Is there a way to uh, tell the for user that the page has this, it will be installed? Because I guess the standard website will not be installed. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, good question. The question is, how, how can the user tell the difference between a PWA and just a normal website? So the demo we saw in the video, uh, that was a PWA. So it downloaded to the home screen. And the difference the, in the way you can tell is if you went to a website that was not a PWA and did the same thing, it said add to home screen, the icon will still appear there. It'll still look the same on the home screen. But when you tap that icon, it'll launch in the browser. So it'll launch in Safari or Chrome. So the, the killer difference there was when I tapped, uh, when we brought up the multi-tasker uh, and we saw all the apps lined up, Google Maps PWA was actually running as its own application. Whereas if we did that with a normal website that was not a progressive web app, you would see that you're just running in Safari. So it's almost the normal web app just essentially like is a bookmark uh, there on your home screen, whereas the PWA is actually an app. And once it's installed, the user We'll never know the difference. Oh, like when you go to a website, how do you know if it's a PWA or not? Yes. Uh, I mean, for us, we're developers, so we can go to like inspect element and see that everything's downloading. I mean, that's how I do it, but I don't. I mean, uh, I don't think for a browser. Example, I I would. Uh, if there is uh, some kind of like 
integrated notification, like you can install right. this app or something. That's what I was wondering. Does anybody know, does Chrome or Safari or Edge have a notification that says, like, this is a PWA? Is that a head nod? No? OK. So maybe not, but honestly, it's probably not a bad idea for them to add that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good question. What else? All right, great. Well, thanks so much for coming, everybody. I'll be around all day, so feel free to bug me if you have any questions.